I'm asking you, have you received the Holy Spirit? The person, the Holy Spirit. And if you have received the Holy Spirit, how often have you received of Him since you received Him? Now, Randy says something that was interesting, and the Lord is using it today in my message. We were talking earlier about some things about witnessing and the need for the Holy Spirit and what have you, and I made my comments, and Randy made a comment, and he says, well, I'll push back a little bit on that, Pastor, and he was good to do that. That, you know, we don't have to wait for some emotional experience to be obedient to the Great Commission and, and hand out our tracts and share the gospel. And he's absolutely correct. But I'm not asking you if you received an emotional experience. And this is where charismatics, Pentecostals, Christians in general, that have had anything to do with the Holy Spirit, that they equate it with an emotional experience. Now I want to ask you a question. Do you think that the Apostle Peter, in his life with the Lord Jesus Christ, walking day by day with the Lord Jesus, wasn't moved emotionally? You know he was. How about that day in Luke chapter 5? This came to me while I was sitting over there. In Luke chapter 5, when Jesus was ministering to the people, and he bowed the boats of the disciples and got pushed out a little bit, remember? And he started preaching to the people. Then he said in verse 5, you know, let down your net after you get done preaching. And they brought in a great, big, net-breaking, boat-sinking load of fish. And Peter was so moved, so moved with emotion, that he turned to the Lord in verse Seven, or verse, uh, let's see, verse eight, he says, Simon Peter saw it, and when he fell to the ground at Jesus' knees, said, Depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man, O Lord. Is there some emotion there, Annie? What do you think? Think you'd be a little emotion going on with you if you did that? Was that the baptism of the Holy Spirit? No. A lot of emotion. I'm here to tell you that you can receive an endowment of power. You can receive an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. You can receive not by you doing anything, but by God doing something, by Jesus doing something. You've heard the old phrase, take it by faith, claim it. I've seen people line up to receive the Holy Spirit. They say, now take it, take it, take it, take it, take it. Claim it, it's yours. Take it, take it, take it, take it. I'm here to tell you that Victoria cannot keep from receiving my hand touching her head. I decided to do something. She just flat received it. She didn't take it. She didn't claim it. She doesn't have to try to believe anything. She just took it. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, God decided to do something. He sent, in Jesus' name, the great comforter, the helper, the Holy Spirit. That day, Jesus baptized that 120 with the Holy Spirit. And all that you've seen that happened on the day of Pentecost, all that you heard that happened on the, Pentecost, on the day of Pentecost, was received not because somebody took something by faith or claimed it by faith. They received something because God did something. The Lord Jesus did something. And there's nobody in this room that can control the Lord Jesus Christ. God is sovereign. And he will do whatever he wants to do, wherever he wants to do it, whenever he wants to do it, and to whom whoever he wants to do. And all Paul is saying here in Acts 19, did that happen to you yet? Did the Lord sovereignly move upon you? Did you receive? He didn't say, did you take it by faith? Have you claimed it yet? Have you received instructions? I have to talk about these things because a lot of us have come up out of or have been near or around the charismatic movement and we've been around a lot of foolishness that the devil has used to blind us of the truth of what God wants to do among us. 
And, Rod, and Rand, the Lord used your statement, Randy, waiting for some emotional experience. Because see, a lot of us equate the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, with an emotional experience. But I'm here to tell you right here from the Word of God that Peter had an emotional experience, but he did not have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And there's a lot of people that have an emotional experiences. They've cried tears. They even shook a little bit. They might have had all kinds of fleshly things happen to them, but were not filled with the Holy Ghost. And some, not all, some have spoken in tongues that have never been filled with the Holy Spirit. I can remember after I was saved and filled with the Holy Spirit, somebody tried to get me filled with the Holy Spirit, and they tried to teach me how to speak in tongues. They start saying, now say this, now say it a little faster, say this, say it a little faster. We, we know that that happened on the day of Pentecost. That It never happened in the book of Acts. Why are we deviating? Why are we walking away from the Bible? Why are we getting into the pocket of men? Let me tell you something. You can always tell when the church is strong is when Jesus is exercising his sovereignty over the church. When he exercises his sovereignty over the church, it's not man-made. It's God-made. And when God makes something, he makes it right. We need to realize this, everybody. A lot of us have in our minds and our hearts kind of stepped back a little bit from this Holy Spirit teaching. From this Holy Spirit teaching. Because right away we think, what are we gonna, what's going to happen to us? Do I have to fall down? Do I have to speak in tongues? Do I have to feel something? Do I have to get emotional? Do I have to do this? Do I have to do that? You don't have to do anything. Because when God moves, it happens to you. Now, here's Peter saying, Lord, I'm a sinful man, falling on his knees. And he even agreed with the pastor this morning. Yes, pastor, that would be very emotional experience. But she also agreed that that is not the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But in John 10, or in Luke 5.10, he says, Do not be afraid. From now on, you'll catch men. Now, I want to ask you a question. A lot of times when the Lord says something, from now on you'll catch men, you think it's going to happen the next second, the next day, or the next two or three days, as soon as they get a, learn how to evangelize a little bit, they'll start catching men, right? Jesus is going to give them a seminar on how to catch men. Once they get all that knowledge, they'll start catching men. But if you go all the way back in, your, in the Word of God, over here to John chapter 20, Go back to John chapter 21, John chapter 21, sorry Scott, John chapter 21, it says in verse 1, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the sea of Tiberias. Now, the great commission has already been given. Jesus has already breathed on them and said, receive the Spirit, which we taught already. That, that simply means that that's when they were incorporated into the body of Christ. They, we all drank of one Spirit. We've all been baptized into one body. They became, in the sight of God, members of the body of Christ. Jesus is their head. He had not yet ascended to the Father yet at this time. You've got to remember, over 40 days... He appeared to them, giving them undeniable proofs. This was one of the undeniable proofs. This is the passage of Scripture here that leads us up to reading about Jesus making breakfast for them. Remember that? But it says, After these things, Jesus showed himself and again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and, it, and in this way he showed himself. Simon, Peter, Thomas, blah, all these different names. His disciples were together. Simon said to them, I'm going fishing. Right prior to Jesus appearing to them, Simon says, I'm going to fish it. What kind of fishing did he go for? What kind of fish was he going for, Annie? Was he fishing for men or, or fish? Yeah, you don't know what kind of fish, but it was fish, right? Look, he's already had the Spirit of God breathe upon him. He's already received the Great Commission. Has more understanding of all these things than you and I had ever dreamed. Lived and walked with the Lord Jesus for three and a half years. I think he was impacted, right? 
probably no doubt more impacted than anybody in this room has would ever dream to be by being with me 19 years in my ministry at this church. Right? And what's he want to do? He wants to go fishing. And he's not fishing for men, but Jesus said, I'll make you fishers of men. So come on over here to Acts chapter 1. And this is where Jesus is ascended into heaven. And it says in verse 3, Acts chapter 1, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days, speaking to them the things concerning the kingdom of God. And it was during those days that Peter went fishing for fish. Jesus said, I will make you a fisher of men. Did Jesus make Peter a fisher of men by all of his instructions? That's what I want to ask you. No. You're going to find out it wasn't until the Holy Spirit came upon Peter and Peter was baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's when he became a fisher of men. Now that does not wash away all the teachings of three and a half years of the Lord Jesus Christ as not being needed or necessary. And we in this church, when we bring a godly man like Ray Comfort in here, and we show his, his programs, Randy gets up here and teaches, and we do all this evangelistic teaching, none of that doesn't mean that, what I'm saying doesn't mean none of that is important. It's all very important. But there's an ingredient that's needed, and there's an ingredient that's necessary. Peter had all this information, he had all this revelation, but never caught any fish yet. Ask yourself the question I gave at the Sunday school class. In the Sunday school class, I said, isn't it amazing that the Lord Jesus had more? Look who he was, the Son of God manifested in the flesh, right? Think about the knowledge that he had. All that he had up until the day the Holy Spirit came upon him. Think about that. More knowledge than the church has ever had in its existence. But did he ever begin to catch men? Not until the Holy Spirit came upon him. Right? Amen. Holy Spirit descended upon him. He heard a voice from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus referred to that at another time saying that I am he that the Father has sealed. I am the one the Father has authenticated. He authenticated him by the Holy Spirit coming upon him. And this voice from heaven saying, you are my son. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Think about this. Then it says, Jesus, about the age of 30 years old, began his ministry. In other words, ministry began not just because revelation and instruction came. Are you listening to me? All of us in this church, you have such instructions. I bet I could call on just, just about any one of you, and you could come up here and give a good Bible lesson. You got good instructions. You're full of instructions. Jesus, his disciples were full of instructions. Think about the experiences they had with Jesus. The multitude being fed. The blind eyes being opened. The deaf ears popping open and, and the mouths, the mute speaking. Think about the lame walking. Think about this. The dead man that came out with a widow, remember? He touched the coffin and said, Arise, Jairus' daughter. Arise, little girl. They've seen all this. Can you imagine how much they're impacted? Now think about this. A lot of us think that we've really been impacted in our life as a Christian. Oh, yeah, I've had that experience. Yeah, I've received that. Yeah, I've been there when that happened. Listen, we're all back in a dark closet compared to these individuals. They had experiences. They had emotions. Right? Through the ministry of Jesus. They were impacted by Jesus, right? Right? All this is big. But were they catching men? Is catching men important to God? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 
He calls people out of darkness into his marvelous light. He redeems people unto himself out of every tongue, tribe, and nation. It's important that fish are caught. You can't have a church unless you catch some fish. Right? The church had to be added. It was added unto the church, 120, 3,000. That was a good catch. But when did that catch take place? After they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. And as I told you last week, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is something that you're supposed to be participating in all the time. In other words, you get baptized with the Holy Spirit, but you're to continue throughout your lifetime receiving of that baptism of the Holy Spirit. A refreshing and fresh anointings upon your life to declare the praises of your God, to show forth the glory of your God all the days of your life. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, was never meant to give you an emotion. Its purpose is not to give you an emotion. Its purpose is not to let you speak in tongues. Its purpose is not for you to be excited. Its purpose is not to entertain the church. Its purpose is not to make us feel like we're something because we had an outpouring. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit is for Jesus Christ. It's not for you. It's for Jesus Christ. Because when you receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, it turns out to glorify and honor the Savior that you love. The Savior that bled, suffered, and died for you. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon God's people is really for Jesus' sake. And if you begin to think, oh, this baptism of the Holy Spirit, this emotion, this rolling around the floor, this vibrating, this, you know, this trembling, this, all these things that we've heard people talk about, okay, speaking in tongues, all these different things, much of that's genuine. I mean, when God gets moving and he moves upon you, you may shake and tremble. I mean, when he came on Mount Sinai, what happened to Mount Sinai? It trembled, it quaked, it started smoking. Holy Ghost comes upon you, you might stop smoking. <laughs> you know, I'm just trying to tell you that when the Spirit of God moves upon you, you, you never know what's going to happen. On the book of Acts, it says, suddenly. Right, what suddenly mean? It means they were surprised. The Lord never gave them all kinds of details what this was going to be like and how this was going to turn out. There was going to be a rushing mighty wind, and it was, this is what it's going to sound like. And, and then, you know, there's going to be tongues of fire in your head. He never said any of those things, did he? He just says, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Verse 4, Acts 1. Being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And, of course, they said in verse 6, Therefore they had come together, and they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It's not for you, it's not for you, it is not for you to know times or seasons. It always amazes me why everybody's looking for times and seasons when he says, Not for you to know it, which the Father has put in his own authority. In other words, it's none of your business. Leave it alone. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. What are you going to receive when the Holy Spirit comes upon you? Power. power. And for what reason? That you shall be witnesses to who? To me. To Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, well, a lot of times when a person reads this where it says, wait, in verse for do not depart, but wait until the promise of the Father. For the promise of the Father, for you'll be baptized not many days. Baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days. People look at that and say, and think this. They think, well, this is just another little link in the chain that the Lord wants to do. We're just going to wait. He's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. That's the way you know, everything's fine now. Here's the principle. The principle is don't go anywhere without the Spirit of God. That's the principle. Don't attempt ministry without the Holy Spirit. That's the principle. So what have you been baptized with the Holy Spirit? Joe and Annie, you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit for about 30 years or, or longer now, right? 
But you can be baptized with the Holy Spirit about 20, 30, 40 years, as long as you guys have it. doesn't mean you're being impacted by it today. I've been baptized with the Holy Spirit for about that long too, Annie. It does not mean that I'm being impacted by it today. Because as we talked about last week, when I gave you the illustration of me and Rick out setting up tree stands on a hot 80 degree <laughs> October 1st day when he shot one of the biggest deer of his life and hurt my arm forever. <laughs> you know, he'd take, off, he'd take a bottle of water and <laughs> take another one. <laughs> then he got the third one and take his time. Jesus said, come unto me and drink. Right, I, I get Rick's example out of that. He's not going to sip a little bit. He said, well, I have the Holy Spirit. I got water now. I keep drinking and drinking and drinking and drinking. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that thirst. You know, throughout your Christian life, you're going to thirst. Right, and what are you going to thirst for? You're going to thirst for the Holy Spirit that can equip you to make you the minister, the minister for God's glory that he really wants you to be. Remember I said for God's glory? This is not for you. If you think receiving the Holy Spirit or desiring to be filled with the Holy Spirit or desiring to outpouring the Holy Spirit is for you, then you're already mistaken. It is for you in a sense, but it's for you for a greater purpose than you. The purpose is bigger than you. It's greater than you. The purpose is for Christ. It's for the kingdom of God. It's for the adding unto the church. When you get filled with the Holy Ghost, whether you speak in tongues or not, when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, when you go through the scriptures, you'll always find something very unique. When anytime anybody's filled with the Holy Ghost in the Old Testament, though it wasn't called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it just said they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Or you go to the New Testament before Jesus even talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, like Elizabeth. Remember when she was filled with the Holy Spirit? What did she begin to do? She began to say something with a loud voice. Right? How about these other individuals that the Holy Spirit came upon them, they begin to say things with a loud voice. You don't have to speak in tongues, but you begin to say something. It gives you this, this ability beyond yourself. Did you hear that? It's an ability beyond yourself. It's an ability beyond your knowledge, beyond your revelation, beyond all that you understand. It's an ability from God to enable you to speak on behalf of Jesus Christ. Remember he says when you're taken before the synagogues and, and before the rulers, don't, don't take time to think about what you're going to say. For in that day it will be given to you by the Spirit what you should say. Right think about this. If you really have a heartfelt interest to, to see Jesus glorified, to see him honored, to see the God that gave his son honored, to see the son that he gave honored, if you're really interested in that, then you should be longing for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. You should be longing for God to move sovereignly among all of us in doing this with power from on high, not once in a great while, but continually. That we continue to be those that drink of the Spirit. Now see, if you look at what I'm teaching you from this crazy, goofball, charismatic, Pentecostal, nutcase thinking, where they say, well, just have another drink, and they all walk around like they're drunk. And they all put on shows. Christians have been putting on shows that's all man-made. That's all manufactured by man. None of that is... It has brought so much reproach against the Lord Jesus Christ and against the church that it's absolutely sickening what it has done. And it has actually caused good Christians like you and I to have a distorted view and a distorted picture of what it's really like to be endued with the Spirit from on high. So the principle that you see here in Acts chapter 1, waiting in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. Luke says, wait in Jerusalem until you be clothed with power from on high, that you'd be witnesses unto me. The principle is, in our life as a Christian, if we want to be the witness and the testimony to Jesus Christ that he's worthy of, then you and I should be longing for, desiring, praying for, seeking God for, that he would move sovereignly among us and pour out his Holy Spirit. Listen, some of you in this church family would be never given over to 
to like Randy and Don or Ray Comfort handing out tracts. You'd be, maybe never be given to that, okay? You could, in a measure, enter into that. But you have within you, whether you know it or not, as a Christian, as a member of the body of Christ, you have particular giftings of ministry within your life to contribute towards the body of Christ. I want to be honest with you. You're never going to really recognize that, what it really is, or walk in it for what it really is, unless that outpouring of the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Because that's, that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and enables you, and say, Pastor, what's that going to feel like? You may not feel nothing, but you'll have something. It says, have you received? He didn't say, have you felt? Have you received? He didn't say, have you felt? Have you received the Holy Spirit? When you receive the Holy Spirit, you know you have something. And when you have something, you're kind of like Acts chapter 3, when the lame man was there looking for, looking for alms. Remember that? Peter and John said this, look on us. I don't have silver and gold, but such as I have. I have something. I have something, and I give it unto you in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. So what you have to ask yourself, what, what, you don't have to ask yourself this, but listen to what I'm saying. When you have something, you have something to give. If I had, Rick's a good friend of mine. If I asked Rick for $1,000, he had it, he'd give it to me. I know he would. No doubt in my mind. Randy would do it. Others in here would give it to me. If they had it, they would do it. They love me, and I love them. They know I'd never ask them for selfish reasons. They had it. But they didn't have it, they couldn't give it. Right? They could not give it. They didn't have it. Rick says, sorry, Pastor, all I got is a nickel. You can have that. I says, well, it won't work very well. <laughs> Just hang on, you need it more than I do. <laughs> But, Jill, if you had the Holy Spirit, have it, such as I have. Let me tell you something, dear. You and, you'd be bold as a lion. You could say anything God gave you to say. And you, wouldn't, you wouldn't tremble. You wouldn't anything in your heart. You wouldn't even back up. You'd be this cute little blonde-haired lady, bold as a lion. People wonder, what happened to her? <laughs> It'd be just like in the Old Testament when the Holy Spirit came upon Saul. It says he was turned into another man. He had something. He had something. You see, you can have something and lose its in impact. Andy, that's what happens to a lot of us. We lose its impact upon us. Because we find in our life we're really not that testimony. We're really not that witness to Christ that we really would love to be. But boy, if the Spirit of God came upon us. You heard that verse of scripture in the Bible where Jesus said, how much more would the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Amen. People say, wonder what that means. It just simply means this. You're a child of God. You've been baptized with the Holy Spirit. But has your baptism with the Holy Spirit waned? Has it left you somewhat ineffectual? When Rick drank that water, that's not the last time he ever took a drink of water. Every day since then, he's been drinking water. And when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that's your first good drink. But that's not your last good drink. You need more good drinks. But I'm going to tell you why the, Holy, why the church doesn't really get the drinks from the Lord Jesus of the Holy Spirit that they really need. is because they see the Holy Spirit as something that's just for them, for their personal experience. I speak in tongues now. When I lay hands on people, they fall down now. Uh, I give prophecies now. Uh, I'm a preacher now. I'm this now. They think that baptism of the Holy Spirit was for them. They think that they were the end goal, the purpose of being filled with the Holy Spirit. But Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit, not for his sake, but for God's sake. And he says, wherever I go, whatever I do, however I speak, I always do all that I do to the glory of God. Jesus was all about God being made known. Christians ought to be about all about God being made known. It doesn't mean that you have to be a, 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 a screwball, a, a weird person, an oddity. Uh, it doesn't mean. It just means you just can be a wholesome person. Just a wholesome person. Filled with the Holy Ghost. And then there you are going through life and you, an opportunity comes by. And then you have the Spirit of God within you. An ability from heaven within you. A power from heaven upon you. 
that you don't even feel, but it's there. You know you have it. It comes to you, and you're assured of it. And you find yourself saying things that you never dreamed you could say. That's right, amen. That's what I'm talking to you today about. Amen. That's what I'm talking to you today, today about. He said, Pastor, well, line us all up. Lay hands on us and pray for us. I'm not going to do that unless God told me to. I live under the sovereignty of the head of the church. And if you guys ever catch me in this church, ever ministering through the laying on of hands, you can just mark it down. The Spirit of God finally moved on pastor. But I'm not going to be like the Quakers of old. I don't know if you knew this or not. You ever hear of the Puritans? The Puritans were people that were byproducts of the Reformation, but they're inside the Puritans. They had a great desire to live holy and godly and just strict lives, but there was a sect within the Puritans that got off. They're like present-day charismatics. They always felt that the Lord was telling them something, showing them something, and whatever the Lord showed them or told them, that was authority. They got to the point that they didn't even see the need for the Scriptures. And everything was the spirit moving. So they seen all of this about themselves. When Christianity begins, all of, it, it begins to be all about you, Christianity dies. When your life as a Christian begins all about you, your spiritual life is now dying. When your spiritual life is all about Jesus Christ, Amen. then your spiritual life becomes alive, right. becomes powerful, it becomes a testimony. Yeah. Let me tell you, I, you guys miss out on so much you don't come on Wednesday nights. And I know a lot of you is how you might be thinking. At least I think this in my mind. Well, they don't want to come to church because they come one time on Wednesday night. The pastor's going to think that we come now. And then we're always going to have to come. Well, if you're thinking that way, you're pretty foolish. I'll tell you that. Because some of the best messages I've ever preached in my whole life are here on Wednesday nights. Oh, yeah, I miss a few, uh, a few beats every now and again. I don't do so well. That happens to all of us. But whoever I tell you something recently... You should have been here. This last, Tuesday, this last Wednesday night, as far as I'm concerned, probably the greatest message I ever preached in my whole life. And it had a little bit to do with the Holy Spirit. I, I want to ask you the question. You heard what I said today. You see the importance of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So what are you going to do about it now? Are you going to send God a text message? In Jesus' name, we need an outpouring. Is that all you're going to say? You'll find out when Jesus talked about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, when he talked about, turn to Luke chapter 11, when he talked about how much more would the Father give the Holy Spirit to you that ask him, he did that on the, on the, on the premise of the disciples teaching them how to pray. Remember that? He says, Lord, you, John taught his disciples to pray. We want you to teach us to pray. And so then we read the Our Father. We think, well, that's all he had to say about prayer. That's not all that he had to say about prayer. He gives an illustration of a friend coming at midnight that wants food for a friend. Food for a friend. Why do we want the Holy Spirit? Why do we want to be clothed with power? Because the Lord is going to send us across the pathway a many that one day will be our friends in the kingdom of God. And they're hungry right now, and they need some food. And you can have all the knowledge, all the wisdom, all the understanding, all the right words to speak, but they're not going to have any food unless it's mixed with the Spirit of God. Paul said, I don't preach the, the Word of God. Didn't, the gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power. It did, it did just come with knowledge and wisdom and understanding, but it came with power. And it was made effectual. So we need, we need this. And so you find over here in this prayer, you weren't here on Wednesday night, so I'm not going to go through it, but the point is, is that the person was knocking on the door of someone who seemed like they didn't want to get out of bed and didn't want to give them what they needed for their friend. And this is a picture of what happens to us in prayer. How many people ever go to prayer and just feel like, ah, oh, it's not worth it. Ah, uh, you know, I'm tired. God's tired. We're all tired. We're all getting older. And you just don't feel like you want to pray. You know where that feeling comes from? It comes from the powers of darkness. Because as I told everybody Wednesday night, when you look at Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 17, it says, put on the whole armor of God. And then it comes down to verse 17. And all prayer and supplication for all saints. When you're praying for the saints, 
When you're praying for God's people that they would be fed, when you're praying for God's people that they would be filled and overflowing with the Holy Spirit, you're going to be contested by the powers of darkness. And Jesus went on to say, he just says, so you're going to have to keep, this person just kept on knocking and knocking, and finally he says, he gave up, got up, got up and gave him as much as he needed. So, this person didn't send a text message. Rick, I need some food for my friend at midnight. Rick, that's the phone. Jill says, who is that? That's the pastor. He wants some food. Oh, brother, can't do it now. Is Rick going to get out of bed? Jill's not getting out of bed. Rick going to get He's getting out of bed. Well, what happens I go over there and start beating on his door? Jill starts kicking Rick out of bed. Give that guy some food. <laughs> right? The, the message here is, is when you go to prayer, you don't go to prayer and, and just pray kind of, you know, dry and dead and recite a prayer. But you come to prayer, you go to prayer with passion in your heart. Because you're talking to Almighty God, and he has passion in his heart for what you really need. And then he goes down here, and he says, So I say unto you, ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and you shall be opened unto you. He's talking about progression in prayer. He's talking about importunity in prayer. And then he goes on to say, If you be a natural, want an egg? Your children ask you for an egg, a fish, or some bread. You don't give them a stone, a serpent, or... Or a scorpion. In other words, you give them what they need. What's all this food doing in this teaching about prayer? We need food to give other people. That's, right, amen. That's what it is. We need food to give other people. Peter had food to give the people. Right. But he didn't have the Spirit until he was baptized with the Holy Ghost. Until the Holy Spirit came upon him. And if you read the book of Acts, you'll find out that's not the only time Peter was ever filled with the Holy Spirit. We find out in Acts 4, he got filled again. And then we know he must have got filled many other times. But, the, the, you know, you can't write the book of Acts if you're going to write every time they were filled with the Spirit. So he says, he ends up and he says this. He says, then if you know how to do this for your children, you know how to give what your children need, you give your children the food they need, how much more will the heavenly, your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask him? And that asking there is that importunity asking. Yeah. Now, some of us are just deader than a doorknob. You look at your prayer life, let's just be honest with each other. You pray about as much as the devil prays. He doesn't pray at all. I'm being honest. Some Christians don't pray. Some Christians, the most they pray, they send a couple text messages to God. God bless so-and-so, bless, 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 help, have mercy, amen. That's a text message. Gia, what would you rather have? David send you text messages... Hi, Mom, how you doing? Send money. <laughs> or David call you, have a lengthy conversation with you, and then you send him the money. <laughs> See the difference here? We've, we've gotten into this plastic, mechanical uh, relationship with God. We really have everybody. And I'm asking you, are you content with all of this? I'm surely not content with it as your pastor. And what we're trying to do here on Sunday morning on Wednesday nights, we're trying to encourage you to see what more you can have for the glory of God. Not for you. We're not talking about what you can have for you. We're talking about what you can have for the glory of God. What you can have to be for the honoring of God. The Bible says God called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And this promise is to... As many as the Lord our God shall call. He, if he called you, this promise is to you. And this promise is something that you're to receive of continually. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, the teaching his disciples to pray was praying for the Holy Spirit. That's right, amen. Praying for the Holy Spirit. Lord. Now, I know you're a Christian. And I know you have the Holy Spirit. But do you have the Holy Spirit in the context of the endowment of power, the clothing of power? To be a witness. Do you have the, the Holy Spirit in the context of having this ability from God that you did not claim, that you did not take, that came upon you sovereignly by the hand of God to enable you to speak? Ron, how often do you speak to your sons about Christ? How often do any of us speak to our children about Christ? Ask yourself the question. 
If you're not even speaking to your children or your mother or your dad about Christ, if you're not even doing that, you cannot claim to be endued with power from on high. I'm telling you that right now. You cannot claim. You may have had a baptism of the Holy Spirit in days gone by, but you're not participating in the fullness of it right now. It has waned from you. You were like Rick when you first got filled. You chugged down too and kept on sipping for a little while, but then you stopped and you haven't picked it up. Because you thought the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the receiving of the Holy Spirit, was about your speaking in tongues. And it wasn't about your speaking in tongues. It was about glorifying Jesus Christ. Right, you thought it was about, oh, we could talk about our experiences. No, it wasn't about you talking about your experiences. It was about you not talking about your emotions. It was about you talking about, I have something. That's right. And look what God has done. God did this and God did that. God did this and God did that. And all of a sudden, as soon as you start seeing God not doing too much, you say, wait a second. How come he's not doing too much? I need more of the Holy Ghost. 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 What do you think happened on, in Acts chapter 4 when they said, stretch forth your hand to heal, what have you? They had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They already made their case before uh, the Pharisees and were told not to say anything. Remember that? But now they're being challenged, and now they're being pushed back, and now they're being told to shut up. Now, now they're, they're being contested. They're, they're being pushed back. You think the powers of darkness are not going to push you back away from your grandchildren, away from your children? Think he's not going to push back for you talking to your mother and dad or your sons? You think he's not going to push back? He pushes back. He pushes back. Ryan, you might be a big, strong Vietnam man, but what are you as a Christian? Are you going to allow the devil to push you back? Think about this, everybody. How about you, Annie and Joe? You allow the devil to push you back and leave your children and grandchildren unspoken to about the living Christ? Think about this, everybody. Think about this. I'm just trying to be real with you. I'm not bringing condemnation. I'm just talking to you out of my guts, out of my heart. I'm just bearing my heart with you. What about me? I need more of the Holy Spirit. So they realized they were being pushed back. As soon as you start realizing you put pushed back, what do they do? They went together in prayer. Yeah, so right. we're doing here on Wednesday nights. I'll guarantee you to come out for prayer at home or at, at, at church on Wednesday. It's all, you have to fight against it. We're all getting older. We're getting more tired at the end of the day. Everything about us. We can let our physical body, our physical everything, just talk us out of all of this. And just get pushed back, get pushed back, get pushed back, get pushed back until the best thing we can say is God bless you to somebody I think we witnessed. <laughs> Am I telling you the truth? I'm telling you the truth, everybody. Or are we going to be like the disciples? They said, Lord, you hear their threats? We can say, Lord, do you hear the, the threats of us being pushed back? You seen what happened to us, Lord? Lord, have you seen what we've become? You see, Lord, that we're just a people of knowledge and understanding, but we're not a people of power. You see what has happened to us, oh, Lord? Stretch out your hand to heal. Yeah. Yeah. Grant your spirit unto your people. Yes, Lord. And see, when your heart begins to cry like that, like the man knocking at the door saying, I got to have food for my friends. That's right. Amen. When you're the child saying, Mom and Dad, I want some eggs, I want some bread, I want some fish, I'm starving. You shall receive. It shall, you shall find. It shall be opened unto you. How much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to you that asks? Right. Listen to me, everybody. You, Don't just say, well, the Lord is sovereign. If he wants to save them, he will save them. He wants to do this, he'll do this. You just never know what the Lord wants to do. Blah, 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 blah. blah. Sarah, Sarah. Get away from all that nonsense. We are the people of God. We are the soldiers of heaven. Yeah. We are the ones that are walking in the footsteps of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In the footsteps of Moses, Joshua. Come on, everybody. We're not just a bunch of little weak, pipsqueak Christians here. We have God as our Father. Jesus as our Lord. The Spirit of God is our comforter. And why should you and I live our, live our lives out without more of the Holy Ghost? Why should we live out our lives? Without more of the Holy Ghost. Why should we not cry? Give me a good reason why not to cry out for more of the Holy Ghost. We need more. Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, Lord, only you can help us. Lord, 
We can't baptize ourselves with the Holy Spirit. We can't fill ourselves with the Holy Spirit. We can't pour out the Holy Spirit upon us. Lord, that's what the church has been trying to do. They've been trying to do the work of God for God. Yeah. But Lord God, we surrender our hearts to you. We submit our lives to you. Do your work among us. Give us a spirit of prayer. Give us a spirit of passion. Give us a hunger to thirst for what you desire and what you want of our lives, Lord. And may it be given to you for your name's sake and for your honor and for your glory. God, our Father, there's so much about our hearts, so much about our minds, so much about our thinking that has to be changed. Lord, change it all. But Lord, in changing it, give us more of your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, give us more. Lord, in our services on Wednesday and on Sunday, whenever we come together, let there come out points of the Holy Spirit. Make us a witness. Make us a testimony. Make us a fire in your hand, Lord, for the sake of Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask you this in Jesus' precious name.